Hello and welcome to the Business Today show. I am Uday Mukherjee. They say India will be the third largest stock market in the world by the turn of the decade. That will be quite an achievement. Uh, and these days there's all, there are all kinds of foreign institutions crawling all over the place from FIIs to private equity investors to venture capitalists to angel investors to foreign direct investors all trying to get a piece of the action. But it wasn't always like this. In fact, Back in the 80s, India was hardly an investment destination for the world. Uh, you could rarely find a foreign player in the Indian market. And there were a band of young men, young then, the likes of Hemendra Kothari, Nimish Kampani, Uday Kota, Vallabh Bansali, who were trying to cobble up something of an investment destination for a status for India. Uh, and therefore, I'm very delighted to welcome one of the grand old men of the Indian investment banking, to the show today, Himendra Kothari, who is the chairperson of the venerable house of DSP Investment Management and has actually been a very important part of the Indian investment banking scene for the last five decades. Uh, Mr. Kothari, it's a pleasure having you on the show and uh, great to see you again after a long time. Uh, thank you, then. I'm very happy to be on the show. Uh, ask me any questions. Otherwise, I can say that India today is uh, doing much better than most of the countries in the world, and I'm proud to be here in India. Thank you. I, I want to start with the episode with BlackRock, because you know today you're DSP investment managers, but just a few years ago you were known to everybody as DSP BlackRock, and, and then four years ago they offered to buy a large part of your stake and own 76% in the company. And they even offered to make you lifetime chairman of the company. But you walked away from that and you instead bought their stake back, uh, BlackRock stake back, and now you're fully owned uh, DSP investment managers. Why did you pass up that opportunity? Why did you not sell that stake to BlackRock? No, BlackRock has been a good partner and Mr. Larry Fink, uh, who is still remains a good friend, uh, I was very impressed, in fact, in the year when I sold uh, uh, to Merrill Lynch my majority stake, uh, or I kept 10 percent, they insisted to uh, tell me to keep 10 percent, and uh, they thought I should add value to them, so a couple of years uh, was a restriction for me uh, to sell the shares. But when we were doing the transaction, BlackRock, Merrill Lynch had sold their business on uh, asset management to Merrill Lynch. And with that, uh, my 40% stake was, I had a right post even that time uh, to buy 100% stake. But I agreed uh, to join hands with BlackRock, uh, which is we are talking about uh, now somewhere in 2000. Eight, uh, eight, nine. Uh, we started the joint venture BlackRock. After over ten years or so, uh, BlackRock and we had a good relationship. Uh, we continued the relationship without. Uh, they are having more directors on my company than my uh, my representing from my side. But the question which was there, BlackRock offered to buy. 76% uh, stake for me, uh, which, uh, well, that's their philosophy to manage the business, where my uh, family business has started somewhere in 1866, much before the stock exchange uh, started. And my great-grandfather was uh, one of the pioneers on the stock, creating the stock exchange. And uh, he was then vice president and uh, first signatory of the stock exchange. So I think to some extent, emotional angles, and uh, there is no logic for me to sell. And I feel India was going to grow, and uh, we kept the shares, and I bought the shares from BlackRock. But do you think uh, Indian institution today, you know, there are these Morgan Stanleys and Templetons and Merrill Lynch's all over the place. Uh, do you think a standalone Indian institution without a foreign brand name can actually stand tall and maintain market share in such a competitive uh, investment banking landscape today? Uh, well, why not? Uh, that said, that doesn't mean we'll in future 
we will not be open to something thinking differently. Uh, but at this moment, I feel, yes, we are doing it since the last few years, and we'll continue to do that, I believe. We raise money also from international investors ourselves. Uh, before even BlackRock came, we were a joint venture with Merrill Lynch. We learned the, basically the systems, etc., from Merrill Lynch those days, and then BlackRock improved on us, our various aspects of our business. In spite of that, there are mistakes there. So the question is not that just because you have a joint venture partner, you will do well, but you can do it on our own selves. Uh, DSP is a well-known brand, I feel, and I believe that uh, we can uh, grow the business from here. Uh, it depends on getting the right quality people, uh, don't make mistakes, and give positive good returns to the investors. Uh, that's what it matters and have confidence of the investors that we don't do anything wrong uh, with their money. Right. I also want to ask you because, you know, while you had these global partnerships, there was also this episode of uh, the iShares ETF, uh, which could have come into the joint fold at some point. And therefore, I want to ask you about active versus passive investing because, you know, there is a view that maybe passive investing will grow. ETFs will grow much larger in size, which are not so large in India today. But globally, ETFs are very, very large. Uh, do you think passive investing over time will become more, more popular in India than active investing, which is where bulk of the funds come in for mutual funds like DSP? I personally feel both will thrive, uh, active and passive. Uh, people will realize that active will have to show better performance. Uh, passive funds of various kinds will come out. Uh, people will come out with passive funds of different kinds and they can create portfolio out of that. So the many people who are managing the portfolio management for the family offices, for them, they can create a portfolio of passive funds uh, and they can uh, create also have an active fund depending on where, they, what kind of fund manager they choose, what kind of specialization they require uh, on which sector wise, how they perform. So there are so many factors, but yes, passive funds will become more uh, 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 growth in future, will you see the growth uh, in passive funds. Uh, that said, uh, people today, what's happened uh, in past, the passive funds, the margins were too small, and today they are getting a reasonable. At the same time, uh, active funds who are charging uh, more will have to reduce their fees. Uh, that will happen, I personally feel, and both will survive on both sides. There's another thing happening, Mr. Kothari, which is that, you know, while mutual funds had a very large part of the equity, uh, equity pie, these days a lot of nimble-footed, smaller uh, PMS schemes are being launched or AIFs are being launched, active fund management again, and because of superior performance in many cases, they seem to be getting more attention from the retail crowd. Uh, how do you see this playing out between mutual fund houses and uh, PMS schemes? I think both will survive. Both should do well, uh, depending on, as I said, performance, uh, depending on the credibility of the managers, uh, depending on the past reputation of the managers. Uh, so I think we are seeing there are a lot of mushrooming of uh, the wealth managers, what you call. Uh, there never used to be too many uh, family offices in past. Only in the last few years, the family office have started, uh, and this is uh, going to have further growth of that. As people have become richer, uh, the business people have started separating, the professionally keeping the family office to choose the investment or investment fund managers. So I think these are the kind of things which are going to happen now. Speaking of family offices, Mr. Kotari, you're uh, you're an old hand at the investment game. Tell us a little bit about your own investing style because I see that the publicly disclosed documents say that you have significant holdings in companies like, say, alkyl amines. Uh, is there a sector like specialty chemicals which you are very fond of personally or see a lot of potential in? Alkyl amine is my brother. 
who is the major shareholder and the promoter. Uh, I was helping him, assisting him in, uh, he's, a, was a, he's a chemical engineer, and uh, since the beginning, uh, he wanted to be in the industry. And today also he has majority stake in Alcala Mines. I was uh, initially, uh, we were holding shares, that in myself, and my side of the family, that is my uh, family, my daughters and myself. And uh, we, in 1992, uh, we decided in half an hour's time what we want to do. He wanted to be in the industry. I wanted to remain in finance. So this is a long-term history. I was a chairman for many years and a director till only a few years back. So my friendship and my, uh, I would say my relationship with my brother has remained uh, very close. Uh, and uh, he is in the, not myself. I am not in the chemical industry or understand the chemical side of business. Hmm. But what about East India Hotels then? I mean, that's something that you personally would have uh, picked uh, and it you've is, been a holder for many years. No, it is a small stake. It's not much stake. So that is a mistake on your part. I don't think I have, I have more than even even one person stake there. So that's not true. Yes, I knew Mr. I knew Mr. Oberoi, uh from many years since 1984 or 83-84, and uh, has been a good friend. Though he's very old now, uh, but uh, he has a lot of liking for that uh, uh, his family and his son and everybody. So apart from that, there is nothing in particular. Okay. Uh, you know, you spoke about Larry Fink in passing. I want to ask you because, uh, about uh, him a little bit and your relationship with him because you know, knew Larry because before he became the, the Larry Fink, right? Uh, I mean, uh, give us some anecdotes of your interactions with him and how the e experience and the relationship panned out over years. Larry and uh, we met uh, for the first time. <laughs> 13 years or so. And uh, first meeting itself, uh, he impressed me. Uh, and uh, that time they were just about uh, $500 million and $500 million of uh, uh, marriage with the took over uh, or merged. Uh, that time uh, I met him and uh, the marriage suggested, why don't you uh, look at joint venture? as uh, we are selling steak. That's the way I met him and I was impressed and uh, he remained a good friend. Uh, I could catch up anytime. I used to catch up the chairmen of Merrill Lynch. There were four chairmen in my time. Uh, they changed there. And uh, I had the equation where I could call up uh, and talk to them over the phone if I had any questions on that. So. The same relationship I had with BlackRock and its very senior colleagues, uh, and I still have a few friends there uh, in BlackRock. So that's the relationship point of view. Uh, if I wanted some guidance, I should take that. Uh, so that's the way it is. Speaking of relationships, Mr. Kothari, I mean, what was your equation with your peers who I mentioned at the start of the show? Because, you know, at the time that you were building DSP, Nimish Kampani was building JM, Pallab Bansali was with NM, Uday Kotak before the bank came about was building the house of Kotak, uh, Kotak Mahindra Finance. Uh, what was your equation with your peers? Was it fierce competition or did you have some kind of fondness, even affection, uh, respect for each other? Uh, there was a, of course a competition. Uh, there was a post business we wanted, we wanted it and by and large we got it. Uh, it's not that. Uh, we were, over that time, earlier Nimesh Kumpani was there, then they came up. We have a healthy relationship with all of them, uh, including Vala Pansali. Uh, so the competition and relationship were two different things there. Uh, it was, uh, uh, depends on the, what the client wanted, was the first focus uh, for us. And, uh, well, we competed fairly and squarely and uh, everybody's strength were used for the getting business and also at the same time uh, servicing your clients. Our strength was international distribution. Hmm. Our strength was uh, working in India and institutional investors. And uh, Vallabh Bansali's strength at that particular time 
uh, was more retail oriented on the point of view. Uh, so that was the thing at that time. Uh, uh, Nimesh was of course uh, strong in budget and acquisition side, which we were also quite strong. Uh, Uday also came later and he improved on all sides of the business. His strength was, he was ambitious. He wanted to be a bank and he got what he wanted. Who do you have the greatest respect for, Mr. Kotari, of all this a few peers that you spoke about, uh, who do you think in your eyes has actually gone on to achieve uh, more than what the early early promise may have been? I mean, who would you I reserve the greatest respect I, and, and I, admiration I, for? I respect for this, I do no respect for anybody, first of all. Respect for all of them. Uh, I must say, they have done a great job uh, on thinking ahead of uh, today what he is uh, in creating the bank uh, thought of it much earlier. Actually, I was offered 2007 a license, bank license. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I took a decision not to go for the bank at that time, which I had uh, To some extent, it was a no competition clause coming in with Merrill Lynch, which I could have asked them, and maybe they would have joined on the side. But then, uh, in my family, there was unfortunately my wife had passed away just a couple of years, one year back. And uh, I thought I will more focus on philanthropy those days and asset management side. In fact, certainly my daughter was coming up over here and uh, we had a good CEO and it would run. So I think a few years my attention was on uh, more philanthropy than one YouTube business, which I did in my, uh, I had always interest in conservation, wildlife. And from there I started understanding what is it happening in the uh, uh, this particularly in conservation side. Today, I'm a chairman of, uh, I started more than 20 years back, uh, Wildlife Conservation Trust, which uh, we are now in 23 states, as being uh, from the, not only the forest guards, which we did about 2,500 anti assisted, 2,500 anti poaching camps, uh, to uh, schools of 900 schools around the forest area, etc. But uh, the one the thing which I realized that one forest is one aspect, more than forest is the climate change app. And uh, we water the rivers coming out of the forest area. So from there, I started the largest conservancy in the world, the Nature Conservancy, uh, which I, I happened to uh, start doing that uh, in uh, about uh, seven, eight years back. And uh, I attracted them to come to India. And uh, today I'm the chairman also on the Nature Conservancy in India. Uh, so that's uh, my that's a passion. But at the same time, I realize it's very important. I do health and education side. That's the other side which right. is my focus on education. So this my time goes in different things in life. Uh, you realize, and the youngsters have to do now their own work. My company is run professionally. Uh, I have a CEO and managing director, uh, Kalpen Pare. Uh, he does that. My daughter, uh, who is also a Harvard graduate, and uh, Wharton and Harvard. And uh, my younger daughter is jumping up to start something on her own. She will do that. So it's the way the life comes. The only thing which we, we have focused, in fact, is don't do something which is not ethical. Uh, uh, don't do something which is, uh, you feel that you are doing wrong and uh, remain on the right path. Right. So what's the future for DSP investment management, uh, Mr. Kothari? I mean, what direction do you see it moving in? Because right now there are many avenues. Your core strength is fund management at this point in time. But you know, there's private equity which is coming up in a big way, particularly with reference to uh, the kind of capital raising which the new digital enterprises are doing. Uh, there is microfinance which is growing quite fast across the country. Uh, do you want to take DSP in or lead or guide uh, with the help of the management DSP in any of these areas or do you want to stick to your knitting of core fund management? We invest ourselves into uh, private equity investments. Uh, we learning uh, and uh, the question of private equity is something which is long term. 
a very long term investment the horizon should be there investors our mutual fund is an open ended funds uh, most of them and uh, your private equity exit is not that easy it can be very profitable but that way to be seen by the investors yes we may go into private equity as a separate business uh, in future uh, maybe my uh, one of my son in law uh, was very keen to start his uh, renewable is according to me is one of the uh, expert in, in the basically in renewable side so you will go where his passion is so i think we have family office they will take a decision in what business we want to be in future yes we can be doing even lending business uh, as we are large capital uh, i was surprised but uh, except one year after marilyn joined in 90, 95 or so we gave one dividend but we have never distributed dividends uh, nor we have borrowed money so i think that's the way we operate and uh, we are conservative and uh, we remain to be conservative in the opening up for doing different businesses well i wish you great luck mr kothari it's very nice to have caught up with you after so many years and my compliments on a spectacular career that you've had and uh, i wish you all the best for the future thank you then it was nice talking to you thank you